Hello students, and welcome to lecture number 10 in Dr. Lewis's course on European history, 1500 to the present. In our previous lecture, we looked at the dynamics of 1930s politics that led to the outbreak of World War II in 1939. Today, we'll be looking at the details and dynamics of World War II, in particular, emphasizing the genocide known as the Holocaust. The major themes we'll be looking at with today's lecture will revolve around the following four questions. Number one, how did the world react to Jewish persecution? Number two, who facilitated the creation of the Grand Alliance? Number three, what challenges did the Grand Alliance face in taking on the Axis powers? Number four, who caused the destruction of the Grand Alliance of World War II? Our previous lecture ended in September of 1939 with the official declaration of World War II, where Great Britain and France declared war upon Nazi Germany to protect Polish independence. What we also pointed out in our previous lecture was that for the first seven months of this war, journalists and historians at the time referred to it as the period of the phony war, because while war had been declared, Britain and France weren't actually sending any troops to fight against Nazi Germany instead negotiated behind the scenes to try and realign the foreign policies of these three different nations as a unified front against the powers of the Soviet Union. This period of the phony war was brought to an end on April 10, 1940, when there was a vote of no confidence in the British Parliament against Neville Chamberlain, bringing Winston Churchill in as the new British Prime Minister. Adolf Hitler knew that Winston Churchill would not negotiate with him on any terms, and Hitler now saw this as a green light for a full-fledged invasion of Western Europe. Over the next couple of weeks, German forces very quickly overwhelmed Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, and soon arrived in the French capital of Paris, essentially knocking the Western Front out in less than a month. At this point, it looked as if Great Britain was going to have to stand alone against the forces of Nazi Germany. Winston Churchill was contacted by Adolf Hitler, and Hitler arguing that if Winston Churchill was willing to sign a peace, that Hitler would come to the peace with the British Empire. Winston Churchill, in return, made a speech to the British people where he said, I have nothing to offer you but blood, sweat, tears, and suffering, but we shall never surrender to Adolf Hitler. What this meant, then, was that the British Empire, which we have to keep in mind was still one quarter of the world's population, was fully mobilized against the forces of Nazi Germany. Initially, Adolf Hitler considered the idea of trying to physically invade Britain to conquer Winston Churchill's government, but soon gave up on a plan that was called Operation Sea Lion. Instead, what Adolf Hitler decided to do was start a process of what's referred to as terror bombing with World War II. On August 23rd, Nazi bombers arrived in the British capital of London, bombing intentionally civilian targets. In turn, what the British decided to do was to bomb Berlin over the next couple of days, once again targeting civilians. The idea behind terror bombing was that if you inflict as much damage as possible upon civilian populations, that civilians would rise up in turn, overthrow their leaders, and to bring about an end to the war. One of the great challenges in evaluating dynamics of the Holocaust, though, is that starting in 1930, 1940, after the terror bombing commenced in Berlin, Adolf Hitler made a public pronouncement stating, quote, for every German slain, 10 Jews will be slain. If we now think of continental Europe as a hostage scenario, where German forces have taken over different areas and are holding Jews hostage, we have to ask about the complicated nature of the Holocaust is who was ultimately responsible for the death of these Jews. While it is sure that Nazis were the ones who killed these Jews and Nazi collaborators killed the Jews. If we think about it as a hostage scenario, the question is to be asked, could more Jewish lives have been saved? The great challenge now for Winston Churchill was asking the question, could the United States and the Soviet Union be won over and brought into this conflict to assist Great Britain in taking on Nazi Germany? To understand something about the dynamics of the genocide we now know as the Holocaust, we need to understand something about German policy when it came to Jews and ask the question, did Hitler force these people to participate in mass murder? In 
Once World War II was over, those who participated in the Holocaust all made the claim that Hitler made us do it, and therefore Hitler is responsible for the Holocaust, not the ordinary men who participated in this process of mass murder. The first group we need to understand when it comes to the Holocaust is a group called the Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen were essentially death squads that followed German armies into Eastern Europe and were in charge of killing Jews, particularly in small villages and communities. The way the Einsatzgruppen carried out their mass murder was they would take Jews out into the countryside, have them dig large pits, and then would kill them one by one, throwing their pits into the bodies. There were a couple of factors that caused huge problems for the Einsatzgruppen initially. Number one, this was an incredibly inefficient process for mass murder. Remember, millions of Jews lived in Eastern Europe. If you were going to shoot them one by one, and if your goal is hypothetically to try and kill all of Europe's Jews, this is a very inefficient system. Number two, it's incredibly psychologically difficult uh, for one person to kill another human being, particularly at point blank range, is a hard job. One of the things to understand also about the Einsatz Group, and as a historian by the name of Christopher Browning, has spent his entire adult professional career studying the Einsatz Group, and, and Christopher Browning's discoveries were quite horrifying. Christopher Browning wrote a book entitled Ordinary Men, where he looked at the Einsatz Group and realized that while these people said after the war that they were forced into these sins, that members of the Einsatz Group were given a choice on a daily basis of whether or not to participate in the mass killings, and that those who chose not to participate were never punished for their choice, which makes the whole aspect of agency when it comes to the Holocaust far more complicated. One of the other characters we need to understand when it comes to the Holocaust was a man by the name of Hans Frank. Hans Frank was appointed in October of 1939 as the general counselor ruling over German-occupied areas of Poland. Hans Frank thought that his initial job was to help facilitate German pioneers to move to the east and to colonize Poland and eventually the Soviet Union. What occurred very quickly was that many of the camps that were set up for Polish civilians started to become overflowed, particularly in the rounding up of Jews. By the summer of 1940, Hans Frank started complaining that his camps were overflowing and that he didn't have a way to hold these people anymore. At this point, a Nazi leader by the name of Heinrich Himmler came up with a solution. Heinrich Himmler had a brand new camp system created in a place called Auschwitz. While of Auschwitz eventually became a mass factory of death, initially the goal of Auschwitz was to build factories right on site and to encourage corporations to utilize the slave laborers of the camp systems in their factories. Essentially the idea that these corporations would now get free employees and you could literally work them to death to produce goods for the German military effort. With the creation of Auschwitz as a, essentially a place of factory slave labor, Heinrich Himmler believed that you could now start moving German supply lines to the east in preparation for their eventual invasion of the Soviet Union. What Heinrich Himmler also utilized by implementing Auschwitz was to create more corporate support for German policy when it came to Jews by offering corporations free workers. 1941 was a pivotal year in the reshaping of global politics. What helped to facilitate this change in international relations was the creation of the Grand Alliance between Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States to take on the combined forces of Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan in World War II. While if this alliance had been formed during the 1930s, World War II could have been prevented in the first place, now with this combined forces coming together, Adolf Hitler was facing the real prospects that Germany would probably lose World War II. What helped to put this process in motion was Hitler making a huge mistake during the summer of 1941 and not learning any historic lessons from the failures of Napoleon Bonaparte in invading Russia. Despite still having a 10-year non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and between Nazi Germany, Hitler decided to implement Operation Barbarossa, 
Going back to Hitler's Mein Kampf of 1924, Hitler had always planned that his foreign policy would be an invasion of Russia, facilitating a scenario where Germans could start becoming pioneers, moving to the east, expanding out, and essentially enslaving the Slavic peoples to the Aryan race. German forces initially were able to drive hundreds of miles deep into Soviet territory because the Soviet Union was completely unprepared for the new techniques of Blitzkrieg War. After getting hundreds of miles into Russian territory, the Russians started utilizing the old techniques of the Russian Empire and taking on foreign forces that come from the West and instituted a scorched earth policy. What became obvious to German forces by the opening months of winter of 1941 was that unless some knockout blow came very quickly toppling Stalin's Soviet regime, the German forces, due to the scorched earth policy, would be facing starvation and freezing. December 7th, 1941, Imperial Japan, without any prior warnings to Nazi Germany, made a fateful error in attacking the American fleet in Hawaii at the naval base in Pearl Harbor. By attacking the United States at this time, Hitler said that Japan had, quote, woken up the sleeping giant. On December 8, 1941, President Roosevelt declared war upon Japan, and then waited to see how Germany and Italy would react. Since Germany and Italy were officially allies with Imperial Japan, Roosevelt was wondering if they'd be crazy enough to actually declare war against the United States. On December 11, 1941, Hitler made his fateful decision and declared war upon the United States, and the United States in turn declared war upon Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. At this point, the American economy and society became fully mobilized for the war effort. Ford and General Motors now redubbing themselves, quote, the arsenal of democracy, arguing that they would now build exclusively for allied forces, cutting off all relations with their subsidiaries in German-occupied Europe. While they cut off relations with their subsidiaries, it's also important to point out neither GM or Ford shut down their factories in Europe. Essentially, they cut ties with them, and those factories in Europe continued building for Nazi forces throughout the entirety of World War II, while factories in places like Detroit were building 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for Allied forces, essentially GM and Ford throughout the war, making arms for both sides. Now the question for Adolf Hitler was that with the Grand Coalition now coming together and the prospects of a loss in World War II becoming quite real, what should his historic legacy be? And we'll see just a month after the United States entered World War II, Adolf Hitler deciding that his historic legacy would be the Holocaust. On January 20th, 1942, a meeting was facilitated at the German city of Wannsee, bringing together 20 different major leaders of Nazi Germany to decide the fate of the Jews of Europe. Now that the United States and the Soviet Union had entered this war, Germany realized that number one, that they were probably going to lose World War II, but number two, with the invasion of the Soviet Union, almost nine million more Jews had been added to German-occupied territory in Europe. The question being, what do you do with millions of human beings? This was an incredibly bureaucratic meeting where essentially individuals like Reinhard Heydrich and Adolf Eichmann sat out maps of different parts of Europe that were occupied by German forces that also had statistics on the number of Jews who lived in these different areas, as well as a train system laid out connecting the different camps of Nazi-occupied Europe. The great question here was, did Germany possess the industrial capacity to murder every single European Jew? It was decided here at the end of the Von Say Conference, after looking at a number of different possibilities and solutions, the final solution was now implemented. The very conscious decision by Nazi Germany to try and murder all the European Jews as the historic legacy of the Nazi regime. At this point, what happened was not building of a new camp system, but a reorganization of the existing camp systems. And at places like Auschwitz, Birkenau, Belzac, and Treblinka, having the installation of gas chambers. What would now happen when prisoners arrived at places like Auschwitz is when they stepped out of the train cars that had brought them there, 
prisoners were quickly inspected by a doctor from the German SS and deemed either fit for work or unfit for work. Those who were still healthy enough and deemed fit for work were now forced into the different slave labor programs that the Germans had set up with multinational corporations right there on site at the camps, where now these Jewish workers would essentially be worked to death. Those who were deemed unfit for work, the sick, the elderly, and children, were now sent off to gas chambers that were disguised as shower rooms. Now became a race of time for German forces to try to, number one, exploit as much wealth as possible out of these human beings, quite literally creating factories of death, and number two, a race against time to see if Germany could murder all of the Jews of Europe. The final death blow to Hitler's dreams of European dominance and conquest was served by the Russians beginning on August 21st, 1942 at the Battle of Stalingrad. There's a couple of things to understand about the Battle of Stalingrad. Number one, still in terms of human history, this is the bloodiest and most murderous battle of all time in the human experience. Number two, one of the main reasons why it became such a deadly encounter for both German forces and Russian forces was that just to the southeast of the Russian city of Stalingrad were the Soviet oil fields. Essentially, if Adolf Hitler was able to capture the Soviet oil fields, Germany now would potentially be unstoppable in conquering larger regions of the world. In terms of the characteristics, both sides were incredibly undersupplied, and both Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin refused to retreat, essentially deciding that the fate of the world would be decided here in one Russian city. On February 2nd, 1943, General Paulus, who had been in command of the German Sixth Army, surrendered to Soviet forces. Of the million Germans who had been sent to Stalingrad, only 6,000 of them would survive this battle and make it home to Germany once World War II was over. What occurred now is this had been the first major loss the German forces had had when it came to World War II. Most people up until this point believed the German forces were invincible. Coming out of this, the Red Army now started to go on the offensive, driving German forces out of Soviet territory and beginning the process of liberating Europe. Believing now that the German people, once they heard news of the losses at Stalingrad, would overthrow Adolf Hitler themselves, Joseph Stalin called for a Western Front to be opened up and for Allied forces to launch an invasion of France, believing during the summer of 1943 that Hitler could be destroyed. What Great Britain and the United States decided to do instead, under the advisement of Winston Churchill, was to continue bombing runs throughout Western Europe and instead to invade further parts of Northern Africa and eventually parts of Italy, what Winston Churchill referred to as the, the soft underbelly of Europe. <sighs> the great question then that historians have looked back on and that diplomats talked about at the time was had the Western Front been opened in 1943, could the war have been won that year? And was it really necessary for it to drag on for two more years? Despite the fact that the Western Front was not opened up during the summer of 1943, the Russian Red Army made huge advances, number one, in driving German forces out of the Soviet Union, but number two, of arriving in areas of Eastern Europe to begin the process of liberation. January 4th, 1944, the Russian Red Army arrived at the outskirts of Poland and began the process of number one, discovering the camp system, and number two, of shutting down the death camps. The greatest tragedy in Eastern Europe during this time was for civilians who were caught between the antagonistic forces of Nazi Germany and the Red Army of the Soviet Union. Essentially, there were no rules of engagement on the Eastern Front, and the great tragedy was for civilians caught between these two forces. Remember, 
The Russians, unlike the United States, the Russians lost close to 30 million people in this war and one third of their entire nation, not just being attacked once, but being attacked over and over and having genocide committed against their own people. What's also important to understand is while war crimes were certainly committed against the Russians, just because one commits war crimes does not mean that they deserve to have war crimes committed back against them. June 6, 1944, the Supreme Commander of Allied Troops on the Western Front, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, took a gamble and launched the D-Day invasion, arguing that Allied forces needed to drive in Europe immediately to support the Russian invasion of Eastern Europe. When the Western Allies arrived at the beaches of Normandy, initially it was a bloodbath, particularly of American soldiers. But once the beachhead was established there at Normandy and a second front was opened, France was very quickly liberated. On August 25th, Paris was liberated from German forces, and more and more Germans who had any common sense started surrendering to British and American forces. Something to understand about the dynamics of the Western Front versus the Eastern Front was that Soviet forces did not usually capture German forces. If they came across German forces, they executed German forces. Whereas if a German surrendered on the Western Front, British and American soldiers were far more likely to follow the rules of engagement laid out in the Geneva Accords. If you were a young German who, were part of, who was part of this war, if you surrendered to the American to the British, you might get make it home alive once this war was over. When the Russian Red Army arrived at the death camp of Auschwitz in January of 1945, the true extent of the crimes of Nazi Germany started getting revealed to the world. It's a quote here from a survivor of the Auschwitz camp, a, a young teenager from the time named Bart Stern, where Bart said, quote, so I was hiding out in the heap of dead bodies because in the last week when the crematorium didn't function at all, the bodies were just building up higher and higher. So there I was at nighttime. In the daytime, I was roaming around the camp. This is where I actually survived. You can imagine being a young man waiting for liberation and hiding yourself from your Nazi executioners by hiding them in these piles of dead bodies. General Gramatsky reflected on the experience of liberating Auschwitz, stating afterwards, quote, the prisoners began rushing towards us in a big crowd. They were weeping, embracing us and kissing us. I felt a grievance on behalf of mankind that these fascists had made such a mockery of humanity. It roused me and all the soldiers to go and quickly destroy them and send the Nazi demons back to hell where they belonged. It's important to understand while British and American forces helped to shut down many of the concentration camps of Germany proper, the death camps of Nazi Germany were located primarily in Poland. It was the Russian Red Army who came across these atrocious sites and who liberated these Jews. In the opening of 1945, it was obvious to everyone throughout the world, particularly to Adolf Hitler, that the fascist powers were going to lose World War II. So on January 4th, 1945, President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stone of the Soviet Union met at the Ukrainian city of Yalta to decide the future fate of the world. Two major decisions that were brought about at Yalta were, number one, since Germany had been responsible now for the outbreak of two world wars in the 20th century, that Germany could no longer be a unified nation, and that Germany would be split apart into different zones of occupation by the major powers of the Grand Alliance. Number two, despite the fact that Winston Churchill had primarily fought World War II to save and to protect the British Empire, President Roosevelt and Joseph Stalin believed that European empires had been the cause of global conflicts throughout the beginning of the 20th century. And then in order to prevent something like World War III from ever happening, European empires needed to be brought to an end. That the United States and the Soviet Union would become the best of friends and allies at the end of World War II to bring an end to European empires, start the process of decolonization, and to make sure that World War II was truly the war to end all wars. The problem with the Yalta Conference is that these three men would never have an opportunity 
to sit down with each other ever again. On April 12, 1945, news was announced that President Franklin Roosevelt had died, and that now Harry S. Truman, the Vice President of the United States, would become President of the United States. Number one, Joseph Stalin had developed a very deep friendship and respect with President Roosevelt and did not trust Harry Truman as the new President of the United States. Number two, for several months now, a secret project had been going on called the Manhattan Project, where the very first atomic bomb in the world had been developed. On Harry Truman's first day as the new U.S. President, he was told about this secret bomb, but also told whatever happened, not to tell Joseph Stalin about it. The problem is Joseph Stalin had spies on the Manhattan Project and already knew about the atomic bomb. So the very first time he ever had a chance to meet Harry S. Truman, he believed that Truman revealing the bomb to him would be a first sign of trust building between these two major world leaders. On April 30th, 1945, approximately two weeks after Russian forces had arrived in the German capital of Berlin, Adolf Hitler died, committing suicide in a secret bunker there in Berlin, not wanting to be captured by Russian forces. Within just a few days after this, Nazi Germany finally surrendered to the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain, bringing an end to the European campaigns of World War II. Just a couple weeks after Germany had surrendered, an individual by the name of General Reinhard Galen surrendered to American forces. Throughout World War II, General Reinhard Galen had been head of German intelligence on the Eastern Front, which meant he knew all of the German secrets, he knew a lot of Soviet secrets, and he was also a war criminal because those who participated in the Eastern Front were the facilitators of the Holocaust. After the defeat of German forces at Stalingrad, General Galen started making copies of different Soviet and German documents and hiding them away in microfilm in the Austrian Alps. General Galen, when he surrendered to American forces, stated that he was willing to share his information with the Americans, number one, if he was given full immunity, number two, if he could pick 4,000 other German intelligence officers to assist him in the creation of a brand new intelligence agency that would serve exclusively the whims of American politicians, the CIA, also known as the Central Intelligence Agency. Harry Truman, for the fact that he had only been president at this point for just over a month and they knew very little about international relations, accepted this offer from Reinhard Galen and hired on Nazi war criminals to assist in the creation of a new intelligence agency. Now the great question facing the world, while the Grand Alliance of Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union had brought an end to Hitler's reign, could this alliance be maintained, particularly the friendship of the Americans and the Russians? Now to understand what occurred at the Potsdam Conference of 1945, and what facilitated the outbreak of the Cold War. I'm gonna use a gambling analogy. Imagine that if you were at a casino playing the game Blackjack, also known as 21, and that you were dealt a hand of cards and you looked at it and you had an ace and you had a queen, that you believed you had an absolute winning hand, so you took all of your chips and you put them all in. Just after putting your chips in, imagine that somebody came through, tapped you on the shoulder, you turned around to look, and when you look back, your two cards had changed, but you'd already put all of your chips in. You're left with the question, what the hell just happened? Welcome to the world of Joseph Stalin at the Potsdam Conference in 1945. Stalin, who was used to negotiating with President Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, now had to sit down and meet with two other world leaders, essentially the two cards they had being changed. Number one, Potsdam was the very first time that Stalin had a chance to meet Harry S. Truman, the new president of the United States. The other great challenge at Potsdam was the very first day of the conference, a general election was held back in Great Britain, and Winston Churchill's conservative party lost this election. So after the first day of the conference, Winston Churchill was told he was no longer the British prime minister, 
and they needed to go home, and they would be replaced now by the new Labour Party Prime Minister, Clement Attlee. What Harry Truman and Clement Attlee had in common is they were both vehement anti-communists and both believed definitively in the idea of democracy and free elections in Eastern Europe. What occurred here was number one, Stalin wanted to see if he could trust Harry Truman by baiting him with different questions about the atomic bomb. Stalin knew about the atomic bomb due to his spies on the Manhattan Project, but he wanted to see if his American ally would tell him about the bomb. At one point, Harry Truman made reference to a secret weapon and then quickly changed the subject. Number two, both Harry Truman and Clement Attlee stated that free democratic elections needed to happen in Poland. What Stalin retaliated with is he said that Poland had been utilized now by German forces twice in this century to invade his nation, and that between World War I and World War II, that the Russians had lost close to 40 million people. And he asked the question, what if the Polish people democratically elected a fascist, anti-Soviet government? And Truman and Attlee replied that if that were the democratic will of the Polish people, then Stalin would have to accept it. What Stalin did in return is instead of accepting free democratic elections in Poland, is he propped up a communist government, a dictatorship there in Poland, and then expanded out communist dictatorships over the next couple of years in most nations throughout Eastern Europe, essentially creating a huge buffer zone to protect the Soviet Union for any future invasions from the West. Many historians argue that the Cold War is something that started, let's say, in 1949. I take a little different approach to this. I argue the Cold War started on August 9th, 1945. What helped set this process in motion is on August 6, 1945, the United States made the fateful decision to drop the little boy atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. In 45 seconds, an entire city was flattened to the ground, 80,000 people dying instantly, either being vaporized or dying from the atomic rain that came raining down there on August 6, 1945. In total, 166,000 Japanese were killed there at Hiroshima. President Truman, after the dropping of the first atomic bomb, contacted the Japanese emperor and said the United States had enough bombs to do this to the entirety of Japan, and the Japan, to prevent this from happening, needed to surrender immediately. The truth was the United States only had one more atomic bomb, the Fat Man Bomb, that was dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki on August 9, 1945. Very similar to the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, 40,000 people died instantly, 80,000 total died. What Harry Truman did here was he gambled and had his best poker face on and put out the bluff once again that the United States had enough bombs to do this to all of Japan, and that the Japanese emperor needed to surrender immediately. Within just a couple of days, the emperor did exactly that. The great question was, was it necessary to drop these bombs? And number two, since Truman kept these bombs secret, was this a phenomenon of atomic blackmail against the Soviet Union? What I would argue is that any of the goodwill and positive feelings that had been built between American and Soviet leaders disappeared overnight with the dropping of the atomic bomb on August 9th, because over the next four years, the United States was the only nation in the world to have and to own atomic weapons. Essentially what occurred after the dropping of the Nagasaki bomb was that powers throughout the world were now forced to choose a side, either with the communist side of the Soviet Union or the capitalist side of the United States. And two powers that had been allies and had promised to remake the world together as friends and allies after World War II now became enemies. And the Cold War created a period of intense competition that we'll discover in our next video about this about this power struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union.